I just wanted to, to share a little bit. Uh, I want to introduce a little bit about my family. So if we could have that first uh, slide. This is a picture of my family. Um, yeah, there's my son in the back, and then my daughter, Eden, and my wife, Susan. Uh, we've been, Susan and I have been married 26 years, and uh, that's actually how long I've been in ministry, 26 years. So there's actually a kind of funny story behind that. So when we first met, uh, we met at church down in Irvine, and when we first started dating, uh, my wife was a junior high teacher, and then I was... Uh, economics instructor at community college. So we were both teachers together. And so when we got engaged together, we felt like this is going to be so great. We're both teachers and we get our summers off together. We can go travel and do whatever during the summers. And so that's how we went in. When we went to our marriage, we're thinking we're going to, I'm a teacher, she's a teacher, and this is how we're going to start our marriage. So we got married in June, June 21st, 1997. And then in I think it was actually the next month in August, that's when the Lord started speaking to me about ministry. Now, ministry had not been on my mind at all, zero. I had never thought even for one second about ministry. I had been a part of church, I've served a church, but ministry, no, 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 no. Like, I just finished my master's in economics, this is what I'm going to do. You know, I'm going to start teaching at community college. So, but every time I spent time with the Lord, he kept bringing that to mind again. He kept bringing in ministry to mind. But I was like, Jonah, no, no, <laughs> that's not for me. I just got married. I just finished my master's. There's no way I'm going to have a career change, right? So I went the other direction. But again, the Lord kept persisting. It was practically every single day when I was spending time with the Lord, the Lord has kept speaking to me about going into ministry. So this happened for like weeks and weeks. And eventually the Lord kind of, I feel like he just wore me down. <laughs> I feel like, okay, I don't think this is going to go away. I think I need to be open to what the Lord is saying. But how am I going to tell my wife? My newlywed wife, we had only been married just a couple months. And I just, I couldn't do it. I was so afraid. Like, how am I going to tell her that the Lord is calling me into ministry? This is like the ultimate bait and switch, right? She thought she was marrying a teacher, and then after we got married, suddenly I'm going to go into the ministry. I'm like, no, I can't. I can't do this. I don't know how to be able to tell her. So I, I don't know how many weeks. I waited weeks. Every day I would look, is this the day? Is it? No, no. Just, she seems tired. Like, let's, let's do another day. Let's do another day. And I could not... Build up the courage to tell her. Okay, but finally, finally came the day where I felt like, okay, this, I have to say, it's like killing me, right? And so I said, Susan, you need to sit down. I have something really important to tell you. She's like, what's going on? You know, like, and so I sit her down and basically kind of share what I was sharing with you that I felt like the Lord has been calling, giving me a call into ministry. And you know what her response was? Oh, I knew you were going to tell me that. What? There's no way. I had not told anybody in this whole world that I was thinking about going into ministry. There's no way you would have known. And then she told me while we were engaged, uh, the Lord gave her a dream. And in the dream, I was preaching a sermon from the podium, and then she was sitting in the front row. And she said, the Lord already spoke to me that this was going to happen. And I said, why didn't you tell me? I've been agonizing for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, right? But she was so wise. She said, a decision like this, I know you needed to hear from the Lord directly. I didn't want to influence you. And so God spoke to her ahead of time, and I started Talbot that fall and uh, was a pastor for 25 years. And then I transitioned, as Pastor Sam said, to a new ministry called Standing Stone. Uh, so let's take a look a little bit about what this ministry is. I'll just share really briefly. Standing Stone Ministry, our tagline is shepherding the shepherds. And what that means is we come alongside pastors and missionaries. So we shepherd those that are always focused on shepherding other people. We take care of those that are always focusing on taking care of other people. We come alongside them. We come minister to them. We come walk with them. We come listen to them. We pray for them. We encourage them. We build them up. And this is our ministry is to reach out to those that we feel like that doesn't come to mind needing ministry. You know, I share about my standing so ministry because we have to raise our own support uh, because we offer it all for free. 
There's no strings attached when we minister. As a result, we have to raise our own ministry. And so as I do my fundraising and I share about Standing Stone, some people are saying, wow, I never thought about a pastor needing ministry, right? Because they're the, always the ones in the place of doing ministry. But as I've been stepping into this, I really realize this is so crucial. You know, especially coming off of the pandemic, I think even more that pastors really need someone to walk alongside with. Let me share with you a, a few statistics um, that we've come in Standing Stone. And here's just a few of those. 65% of pastors don't have one trusted friend. Uh, all their life revolves around church. And so if they have problems, especially at church, they can't share with anybody. And a lot of times they can't even share with their wife because their wife is a member of the church. 59% of pastors don't feel qualified to lead. 90% of pastors say ministry is completely different from what they, th what they expected. 50% of seminary graduates leave the ministry within the first five years. This one's especially important to me because one of my main ministries at Standing Stone is working with seminary students. So we started a, a pilot program at Talbot Seminary uh, where a lot, of the, a lot of the pastors here graduated from. So I go every semester, I go to Talbot and I share with the graduating classes about this ministry. I share statistics like this, that we don't want you to be one of these 50% that drop out of ministry. This last statistic is the one that actually the Lord prompted me to use to enter in. We are losing 1,500 pastors a month in the United States. Every month, 1,500 pastors. This, was, this statistic was before the pandemic. It's even more now. And when I saw the statistic, I thought, are there even that many churches in America? How can we be losing 1,500 a month? But it just really, really impressed upon my heart that the need is great. And so even though it was very, very hard, me leaving uh, my home church, and um, it was very difficult. You know, they were closer to me than my actual family. And so it was so hard, but I felt the call was so clear from the Lord. Stand in the gap. Stand in the gap. Because my heart has always been for the local church. And he said, this is the way to minister to the local church by ministering to those that shepherd them. And so that's what led me into this ministry. Uh, the, like I said, the local church has always been something very, very important to me. And so even coming to this church was a big deal. Like where I go to church is very, very important to me. And so the, as Pastor Sham said, the Lord spoke to me so clearly here. And I just want to share just how blessed I've been to be a part of this church. Genuinely, from my heart, I just want to share with you that it's been a privilege to be a part of this body. It's been a privilege to see a people whose heart for the Lord. It's a privilege to see people who are so passionate and dedicated and desiring to seek after the Lord's heart. And to be a part of this body has been just a huge Huge blessing to me. You know, as a pastor, it's hard to make a transition from being a pastor and then coming being a regular member. It hasn't been easy for me. But being here, being under Pastor Sean, Pastor Sam, all the leaders here has made it so easy for me to just come underneath and to really minister together and to fellowship together with all of you. So I just wanted to share just how grateful I am for you guys, for all of you, for the church here. Well, today I wanted to share a, a message that the Lord has been putting on my heart and as I've been praying for today, and it's called a working rest, a working rest. But before we dive into the, the passage, I wanted to ask this question. Okay, so I kind of Googled this question. What are the most quoted Bible verses? Okay, so I looked at the 50 most quoted Bible verses of all time. Okay, I just want you to think of, I'm only going to show you the top five. Okay, so turn to your neighbor, see if you can get one that came out in the top five. Okay, so just take a few seconds, introduce yourself if you don't know them. See if you can name one of the top five Bible verses quoted of all time. Okay, let's see how many you can get. Okay, number five, 
we have Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Number four, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Number three, Romans 8.28. One of my personal favorite. God causes all things to work together for those who are good. Number two, Jeremiah 29.11. For I know the plans that I have for you. And number one, does everybody know? John 3.16, still, still, still the most quoted Bible verse, John 3.16. Well, it's interesting. When we think about those different verses, you probably have heard those verses many, 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 many times throughout your Christian life, especially if you've gone to church for a while. You're probably very familiar with a lot of these verses. But there's something that happens when we hear a verse a lot, is we start getting familiar with it, right? And they have that... They have that phrase, familiarity breeds contempt, and I think that's true with the Bible. Like a lot of times when we look at the Bible and we hear different passages where like different parables that Jesus talks about are, are different things in the Bible, we start getting so familiar with it, we don't feel like we can learn anything new. And so uh, one of these passages was like that for me was actually Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. This is a passage that I memorize, that I go to frequently over the years, like I would go to this passage a lot, you know, very, very frequently. Okay, so it was uh, sometime last year, and there's a period of about six months where the Lord started speaking to me about Matthew 11, 28 through 30, not every day, but pretty often. Like almost periodically, all throughout the six months, he kept speaking to me about Matthew 11, 28 through 30. So when he first started doing this, I was like, Matthew eleven twenty three. I love that verse. Come on to me, all who are weak and weary and heavy laden, and I will give you. I love that verse, and I go to that verse all the time. Okay, so as the Lord started speaking to me, I was like, okay, that's great, that's great. And then when He would speak to me again, okay, that's good. I'll keep, I'll keep on entering Matthew eleven, and then again, and then again, and then again, and I'm like, okay, I'm a kind of a slow learner, but. I think I'm not getting something because the Lord keeps talking to me about this passage. And so then I started asking the Lord more specifically, what is it about this passage that you want me to know because you keep speaking it to me and I don't think I'm getting it? Okay? So then the Lord started systematically speaking to me and saying, Sam, the reason you love this verse is because you love the invitation in verse 28 where it says, come unto me all who labor are heavy laden and I will give you rest. He said, you relate to this. When you're burnt out and you're tired, you feel stressed, you feel anxious, you love this invitation that Jesus is giving in verse 28. And I said, yes, Lord, I love this invitation. But then he said, but what I'm inviting you to in verse 29 and 30, you don't have any idea what that means. And I was like, but Lord, I've been memorizing this passage, quoting this passage, meditating this passage, literally hundreds of times throughout my years as a Christian. I don't know what this means. You don't know what I'm inviting you to. And so over the course of the next however many months, he started systematically taking me through Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Okay, and I want to share with you just some of the insights the Lord had given me. Okay, so first he says, Come unto me, all who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Then he says the invitation is, take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay, so that's his invitation to all those that are really tired and burnt out. He says, take my yoke upon me and learn from me. Okay, so when you understand this passage, they're in an agricultural society. So if you're familiar with what, what a yoke is, if we can look at the next picture, a yoke is this. The yoke is that big wooden bar that they put on top of the oxen. Okay, so if you understand what a yoke means, the oxen, they don't wear the yoke all the time. They don't, they don't go around all the time wearing the yoke and feeding. Wearing, they only wear the yoke one time. What time is that? When it's time to work. Right? That's the only time they wear the yoke is when it's time to work. So they can pull in unison together. That's the only time they wear it. And the Lord started pointing out to me, and where I was pointing out, I was saying, that doesn't make any sense. Who is he talking to? He's talking to people who are tired of working. 
They're burnt out. They're weary. They're tired. They feel overwhelmed. They feel burdened. They feel a heavy weight on their shoulders. And then Jesus is inviting them to do what? Work. That doesn't make any sense. And then the Lord started pointing out to me. He said, yes, this doesn't make any sense to you because you don't understand what it means to rest. You think resting means no work. And I was like, yes, Lord. I think resting means no work. He said, obviously that's not true. Because Jesus' invitation in this passage is to work. And what is the result? Rest. He says, take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly heart, and then you will find rest for your souls. He's saying, Sam, there's something you don't understand about this passage. Because you think having rest means no work. He said, you don't understand what it really means to rest in the Lord. And then he said, you don't know what it means to work. You don't know what it really means to work and having a work that produces rest. And I said, okay, Lord, teach me. Teach me. Okay? So the first thing he started showing me, he started showing me what this word yoke actually means. Okay? So obviously it is true. In the agricultural society, that would be the first imagery they would have is they would have that picture of that yoke that sits on the oxen. But then the Lord took me to another passage. Okay? In 2 Corinthians 6.14. Let's take a look at that. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be unequally yoked, with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? Okay, so you might have heard this passage before, and when you've heard this passage before, usually pastors use this passage for what? Marriage. Well, everybody knows that, okay? <laughs> they talk about it in terms of marriage, even though this passage doesn't talk about marriage. If you look at the context of this passage, it has nothing to do with marriage, okay? But Pastors use it in terms of marriage, and there's a reason why. Okay, look at, what, look at what this passage says. Paul is saying, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Okay, he's not saying that we shouldn't have any kind of relationship with unbelievers. That's obvious. We need to be engaging with unbelievers. But he's saying, this type of relationship you shouldn't have with unbelievers. Okay, so the word unequally yoked is a Greek word that's made up of two other Greek words, Heteros and zugos. Okay, so zugos, heteros means different. Different, like heterosexual, different sexes. It means different. Zugos means kind. Okay, this he's saying don't have fellowship of a different kind. Okay, because if you have this, you cannot have this kind of relationship with an unbeliever because they are of different kind. He's not talking about they're not Different kind and they're a different species, but they're a different kind and two they are internally. Spiritually, they're of a different kind. And you cannot have this deep, intimate relationship with someone who doesn't have that also. And that's why they use it in terms of marriage. When you have this deep, intimate relationship and fellowship together, you need to be together with the same kind with the same heart, with the same spirit, with the same values, with the same intention. You need to be connected in that way. And so when Paul uses the word yoke here, how does he use it? It's intimacy. And it's not just intimacy, it's a deep, deep intimacy. This word that Paul uses here in 2 Corinthians 6.14, being yoked, is exactly the same word that Jesus uses in Matthew 11, verse 29, when he says, Take my yoke upon you. When we look at this passage, is it an invitation to work? Yes, you will be working. But the primary invitation is actually for intimacy. The primary invitation that Jesus is giving here is to be intimately connected together with him. And if you think about that, we can look at that picture of the two oxen. You're going to look at it differently. If we look at that picture again, if we could bring that up, the picture of the two oxen that are yoked together, if one of them is Jesus... The other one is supposed to be you. You're supposed to be intimately side by side connected with Jesus. And when, if you think about the bar, the bar could look, seem like to be a heavy weight, which doesn't make sense if you're already tired. Why would Jesus say, come put this heavy bar on you that seems heavy to carry and restrictive to you? But Jesus is saying, that's not the purpose of the yoke. 
The purpose of the yoke is to keep you exactly where you want to be, which is right next to me. The purpose of the yoke is to keep you attached to me, abiding with me, close to me. The purpose of the yoke is to keep you exactly where you want to be. It's not restrictive. It's not a heavy weight. It's something that actually keeps you exactly where you want to be, where you need to be, where you need to be intimately connected, yoked together with Jesus. This yoke actually keeps you and guards you and protects this intimacy you have with God to keep you close with him. This is the only way you're going to find rest in your work is if you have intimacy with Jesus. If you're yoked together with Jesus, that's the only way you can have rest in your work. Fruitfulness comes from intimacy. You know, I have this, I have this ministry where I minister to pastors and missionaries. And can I tell you, they are, and I, I, I could be one of them, I, I include myself, very, very like driven and focused. You know, they want to make a difference for the kingdom, and that's a good thing. They're constantly focusing on ministry and, and, and reaching people and teaching and preaching and doing all sorts of different things that are involved in the church. But when I, minister, when I meet with them, and a lot, most of the people that I meet with are like this people in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. They're burnt out. They're worn out and tired. And I think a lot of you could relate to the same thing. Even though you're not in the role of a pastor or missionary, you could feel this way too. But I find like the number one thing that I see for those pastors and missionaries that I meet with, they don't have the intimacy with God. They make it about doing. And they're constantly doing and doing and doing and doing and doing. They're doing good things. So it doesn't, doesn't hit their mind that they're doing something not right. And it's not that what they're doing is not right but it's the power by what they're doing. And I think the same is true for us, isn't it? That the things that we could be doing are good things. You know, serving our families, serving our church, could be doing things in your workplace and wanting to be a good representative of who Jesus is in your workplace, wanting to be diligent, want to be responsible, want to carry those things out. But how are we doing it? It's interesting when I had a picture of this Matthew 11 and Jesus' invitation to put my yoke upon you. I don't know why, but in my in my mind's eye, I thought I had pictured myself with no yoke, and that Jesus' invitation is to put his yoke on me and be yoked together with him. And so the Lord started speaking to me about that, saying, Sam, is that true? Do you have no yoke on? And then you come and put Jesus' yoke on? And when I thought about it, I'm like, no, that's not true. I don't have no yoke on. Is that grammatically correct? (laughs) I'm not that situation where I have no yoke. I actually do have a yoke. I have my own yoke where I'm doing the pulling. And then he took me to this passage in Galatians 5.1. Let's take a look at this. Now, this passage is interesting because Paul starts out and says, it's for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Again, that word yoke is exactly the same word that Jesus uses in Matthew 11. It says, do not be yoked together with slavery. When you look at this passage, this verse, the beginning of this verse actually is kind of like a no-brainer. Like, what are you talking about, Paul? It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Why else would he set us free unless it's for freedom, right? This is like a... This is like a death kind of thing, right? Why else would he set us free unless for freedom? But when you look at this passage more, it's actually very telling. He's saying the reason that Jesus came to the cross, the reason why he died was to set you free, to set you free from sin, to set you free from bondage, to set you free from all the things that are burdening you, to set you free from all the things that are encumbering you and bringing you down and not giving you life. He came to set you free from all those things But when we look at the second half of the verse, is that freedom is not automatic. And what I mean by that is, it's not automatic that you live in that freedom. Because what does he say after that? He says, it's for freedom that Christ sets you free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. That yoke of slavery is our own yoke. It's through our own trying. 
when we feel like, if you think about the yoke, what is the yoke? The yoke is when you have the oxen together and then you're supposed to do what? Pull. You're supposed to pull the load, right? But if you have your own yoke on, then who's doing all the pulling? And then Jesus was addressing this to me and saying, before you accept my invitation to put my yoke on you, you have to do what? You have to take your own yoke off. You have to take your own yoke. And so the Lord's answering this question is, what does it mean to take off your own yoke? What does that mean? What does that mean for you to take off your own yoke? Well, like I said, if we're going back to the agricultural example, right, with the oxen and you have, the, you have your own yoke, then who's doing all the pulling? Who's in charge? You're in charge. You're responsible. You're the one responsible for everything in your life. You're responsible for everything in your ministry. You're responsible for everything in your family. You're responsible for everything that happens with your kids. You're responsible for everything that happens in your marriage. You're responsible for everything that happens in your workplace. That's on you. You're responsible for all of those things. You need to carry that weight. You need to be responsible. And when we hear those things, it's hard for us because, is that true? In some sense, that's true. We are responsible. These are the things that the Lord has given us to steward. But it's how we're stewarding that's the important thing. When we think about this passage, we think about what it means to accept Jesus' invitation. He's saying, you can't accept my invitation to put my yoke on you while you still have your own yoke on. You have to take off your yoke, put it on the ground, and actually leave it there. Right? How many times have you taken off your yoke and surrendered all those things and then pick it back up? I've done that so many times. Lord, I want to lay down all my burdens. Lord, I want to lay down my kids. I want to lay down my life. And then the next minute, I put it back on again. And so I have to do it again and again and again and again. And I'm like, when does this actually stop? And the Lord was saying to me, you have to get comfortable enough to take it off and then leave it on the ground. At least long enough so you can put his yoke on. So when he was telling me this, and asking me, and I was asking the Lord, well, what, is it, what does it mean for me to take off my own yoke? And then he said just one word. It's control. You need to give up control. You need to give up control. You need to give up being in control. You need to be up giving up control of what happens in your life. You need to be, give up control of what's happening in your relationships. You need to give up control with your children. You need to give up control in your ministry. You need to give up control in your finances. You need to give up control of your future. You need to give up control. And I was telling the Lord, that's not easy. <laughs> that's hard. That's hard, Lord. How do we do that? You're telling me I can't even accept your invitation until I do this? This is a whole big step in itself. Before we even get to putting on his yoke, we have to do this. And the Lord said, the only way you're going to do this is if you change your mind about what, this is as what I'm asking you to do. Because when you think about giving up control, about surrendering, about being dependent, about those things, what comes to your mind? What comes to your mind when you feel heard the words surrender or be dependent? or giving up control? What comes to mind? In my mind, it feels like I'm giving up. I'm giving up, like I lost. Like, actually, that's what we use surrender for. Like, I surrender. I give up. I wait the white flag. I surrender. I basically, I lost. I have to give that up. So that's my view of surrender, is like, you have to surrender these things, and you have to lose it. And the Lord was saying, that's not true. That's a lie. That's a lie you've come to believe. And so he was telling me is, what I'm asking you to do is to give up control and to surrender everything in your life. So what he was asking me is, is everything in your life something bad? Is everything in your life bad? 
Am I asking you to throw away everything in your life? Your marriage. When I ask you to surrender your wife, am I asking you to throw her away? When I ask you to surrender your kids and lay them down, am I asking you to get rid of your kids? No. He's not asking us that. There's some things in our life that are harmful for us. There's some things in our life that sin that we carry. Those things we want to lay down. And yes, we want to get rid of those things. But he said, those things are a small percentage of what I'm asking you to lay down. I'm asking you to lay down everything. I'm asking you to give up complete control and to lay your yoke on the ground. So then he is saying, if this is what I'm asking you, you have to change your mind about what it means to surrender. Okay, so it was 2016, and my family was going through a very, very difficult time. It was like the valley of the shadow of death, period. You know, my, my wife was, had like a life-threatening uh, illness that got uh, diagnosed and through the surgeries and then had all these complications coming out of it. At the same time, my children were going through different things and they were suffering and then I was going through physical things. I was experiencing a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. Like I had uh, these stomach things where I thought it was an ulcer because it was like hurting so bad. Like I could not even get out of bed for some of these days. And this was our experience. Our whole family was going, every single one. You know, me personally, I just was so struggling during this time because I felt like even though I was going through my own personal struggles, this is when my family needed me the most. This is when my wife needed me the most. This is when my children needed me the most. And I felt like, I can't do it. I can't be the husband I need to be right now for my wife. I can't be the father I need to be right now for my kids. I can't even take care of myself. How am I going to take care of somebody else? And it's during this time that my, my church family that I talked about, my previous church, they, they carried us. They were, the, they were the mark too, the stretcher bearers. They literally carried me and my family for almost six months. Literally carried us. They were there every day, night and day, whether it's bringing us meals. Sometimes they had to actually just drive me to the doctor, you know, to get scoped to see if I had an ulcer, which I didn't. I knew it was fear, but had to get it checked out. Like, they were literally carrying us during this time. I had never been so dependent in my entire life. Not just on God, but on other people. I had never been so dependent. Coming out of this season, the Lord eventually took us out of the valley. And through some miraculous things that I, I wish I had time to share about, but the miraculous things, the Lord took us out of this valley. And after 2016, in 2017, he started to restore us. And I started seeing new life again. And 20, at the tail end of 2017 and going to 2018, I remember praying this prayer, okay? And this actually prayer is one of the most pivotal things that I ever prayed in my life. I didn't know it at the time. And actually, when I look back at this prayer, I was thinking, this is a strange prayer for me to pray because I don't think I actually want that, you know? So, but somehow in my spirit, I wanted this. And so I prayed this prayer. And the prayer was this. Lord, I know what it means to be dependent on you because I have to. I want to be dependent on you because I want to. I know what it means to be dependent on you because I have to, because of my circumstances, because they're too heavy. I know what it means to be dependent on you because I have to, because I feel physically unable. I know what it means to be dependent on you because I have to, because emotionally, I don't have the strength to keep carrying on. I know what it means to depend, depend on you because I have to. Because this situation seems too overwhelming for me. I can't carry this. I know what it means to be dependent on you because I'm so overwhelmed by what's happening with my children. I know what it means to be depend, dependent on you because I have to. But that wasn't my prayer. My prayer was, Lord, I want to be dependent on you. Because I want to. That's something totally different. I think we've all experienced the former, 
where we felt completely dependent on the Lord because we had to. Because of our circumstances, because of our physical condition, because of our financial condition, because of our relational conditions, we know what that feels like. We know what it feels like. And God can meet us in that place. But that's not the prayer that I prayed on that day. That's not the thing that transformed my life. It's when I prayed, Lord, I know what it means to depend on you because of that. I want to be dependent because I want to. This is where I want to be. This is where I want to be. And so the Lord took me on the journey from 2018, and it's still going today, is to change my mind about surrender and dependency. He's saying, you think this is a negative thing, especially in the West, especially here in California, in the United States, that dependence is a negative thing. The goal is what? It's independence. We celebrate every July 4th. What do we celebrate? Independence, right? What is the goal for retirement? Financial independence. What is the goal for you as a parent? To raise your children and help them to become independent. This country celebrates independence. Celebrates independence, not being dependent. I want to tell you that the Bible celebrates dependence and not independence. That we need to be countercultural. This is not the way society is breeding us and telling us. He's telling us you need to be more independent. You need to work on your weaknesses. And behind that, what is behind that you need to work on your weaknesses? So you don't have to depend on anybody else. The world is saying you need to be independent. You need to be stronger. You need to pull your bootstraps up. You need to get more discipline. You need to work harder. You need to work smarter. You need to get better equipped. You need to learn more. You need to get trained more. You need to do all these things. So you can do it. So you can handle it. You can take on all of these things. You can push through all of those things. But the bad thing is, it's contrary to what the Bible says. That we will find our rest when we're dependent, when we're surrendered. We will find our strength and we will find our power and we will find our fruitfulness when we're surrendered. Because when we're surrendered, then we experience his strength. It's interesting. When you look at different passages in the Bible, like in 1 Corinthians 12, when Paul talks about the thorn in his flesh, and he says, I delight in my weakness, right? Because when I am weak, then he is strong. Can I tell you that Paul is actually not delighting in his weakness? God is not asking you to be a masochist. He's not saying like, oh, I love the pain. I love the weakness. I love the trial. Give me more. Give me more. I mean, Hebrew kind of loses. He says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. Paul is not delighting in his thorn. Paul is not delighting in his weakness. What is he delighting in? In the strength that he's feeling. Through the thorn, he's surrendering. He's giving up control. He's saying, I'm not going to do it. You have to do it. I'm not going to be in control. I'm not going to pull with my own yoke. I'm not going to do that anymore. You need to do that. And when he does that, what happens? He experiences the mighty power of God released in his life. I, what I'm asking you is not to be dependent for dependent self, not to be surrendered for surrendered self. It's for what it's going to produce in your life. When Jesus started speaking to me and revealing this whole idea of me carrying my own yoke, I had this sudden realization. I'm like, oh my gosh. I think I've been carrying my own yoke and because I'm carrying my own yoke, that's the reason I'm weary and tired and, and heavy laden. That's why I keep having to come to this passage in Matthew 11. And the reason I'm so tired is that I feel this load is too heavy and I get worn out. And so what I would do is I would pray this very Christian prayer, which is what? Lord, help me. Lord, help me. But what was I really asking is, Lord, help me come to my yoke and help me pull. I'm tired. This is too heavy for me. Come join my yoke and help me pull. And then Jesus said, that's not my invitation to you. This is not what we're supposed to be praying. 
We're not supposed to, well, there's two kinds of Lord help me, okay? I, I, should, I should pause and say, it. there's two kinds of Lord help me. There's Lord help me because I cannot, I need you to do it. That one's okay. The other prayer is, Lord help me, come to my yoke and help me pull. That one's not okay. But that's the one I found myself praying. I'm tired, Lord. Come help me. But what am I really saying when I'm asking that? Can you come to my yoke? It's heavy. My yoke is heavy. I need rest. I need you to come and help me. And we don't feel like we're praying anything wrong. It seems like a very Christian prayer to me, a very good thing. And I think by his grace, he does honor it. He does come do that. He does come help us. But that's not his intention. That's not his invitation in Matthew 11, verse 29. His invitation is, take off your yoke. This is the reason why you're so tired. Lay it down. Lay it down. It's okay. You can lay it down. It doesn't mean you're giving up. It means actually you're going to experience rest and power and strength. You know, when I hear about things in the mission field, and I love that this church is like so singularly focused on mission. I love that. And I hear just even this past summer, like I got a lot of the updates from the missions teams and, and really like miraculous things are happening. Miraculous healings are happening. Salvation is happening, which is a miracle too. And when I've been on missions, and you probably experience this if you've been on missions, you know when you're on missions, you're very dependent. You feel very dependent because you know, I can't do this. I can't heal anybody. I can't save anybody. You're very dependent. And when you're in that position, what happens? What is the fruit that comes out? God's power comes out. God's fruitfulness comes out. Amazing, supernatural, miraculous things that you cannot do come out. So you, we need to get rid of this mindset that somehow surrendering is being passive, somehow being dependent is being sitting on the couch and not doing anything and being weak and being giving up and losing. That's not true. It's the opposite. When you surrender, then you'll be empowered. When you surrender, you'll have more life. When you're surrender, you'll experience more of his power. That's why when you're yoked to get together with Jesus, and he's inviting you to work, that it's going to produce rest. Because you're not the one in charge. You're not the one pulling. He is. He's not the one. You're not the one having to supply all the power. You're not the one supposed to give all the wisdom and all the strength. He is. But there's a prerequisite for us to experience that. And what is it? You've got to take off your yoke. You've got to lay it down. And it can't be something that you feel like is a negative thing or you won't do it. You won't do it unless you're forced to. And that's what Jesus was saying. You need to change your mind about what it means to surrender and be dependent. He had given me this uh, picture one day as I was praying. And this picture was of me uh, lifting up my kids. So I had my son and my daughter in my hand like this. Okay. And then... <laughs> It's funny how the Lord talks to me sometimes. He said, Sam, look at you. He said, as, as I was going like this, trying to lift up my kids, he said, look how short your arms are. Right? <laughs> I was like, okay, Lord, yeah. He said, look how short your arms are. They're too short. They're too short to lift them high enough for where I want them to be. Your arms are too short to lift up your kids where I want them to be because I have a high calling for them in their life. Your arms are too short. He said, Put them, lay them down so I can lift them up. Lay them down, not to throw them away, not to cast it aside. Lay them down so I can lift them up. Lay them down so I can lift them up. Can I tell you this is a common theme that we see throughout the Bible? James 4.10. Those who humble themselves shall be exalted, but those who... Those who are proud shall be exalted, but those who humble themselves shall be what? Lifted up. Philippians 2, talking about Jesus, talking about this mindset that Jesus had who humbled himself. 
surrendered everything, gave up all his rights as God, laid himself down. And what happens after that? The Lord lifted him up. Physically through the resurrection and then lifted up to the highest place above every other name. God doesn't ask you to, to lay it down, to humble yourself, to surrender, to keep you down. He asks you to surrender and lay it down so he can lift you up. Higher than you can lift up yourself. This is the mindset shift you need to have. You need to pray the prayer that I did, which is, Lord, I know what it means to be dependent on you because I have to. I want to be dependent on you because I want to. I want to experience more rest. I want to experience more of your fruitfulness and power and joy in my life. I want to experience more of what you can bring instead of only what I can bring. You know what the Lord told me? He said, you feel like when you give up that you're going to like lower your sights and you're going to give up on all these things. He was telling me, the reason you don't give up, the reason you don't do those things is because your bar is too low. The bar for your life is too low. Your bar. Your bar is only as high as what you think you can do. Your bar is only as high as what you think you can accomplish. And he was right. When I thought about the vision for my life or vision even in ministry, even to my shame, I said, that's true. My idea of a God-sized vision was, what is the most I could possibly do? And let me add 10%. That was my God-sized faith part. Let me add 10%. And God was saying, you don't need me for that. In fact, you don't need me for any of these things because your bar is too low. We need to raise our bar. We need to expect more from this Christian life. We need to expect more from this Christian life. We need to expect more from a God who's able. We need to expect more from a God who's capable. We need to expect more from a God who's supernatural, above natural, not human, not limited by our human physical bodies and our human physical strength and intelligence and pushing through and all of these things that the world applauds and even the church applauds. No. If we do that, we're going to set our bar too low. Who wants a life what only you can do? That's not the life that God called us to. God called it to a life where it's so high that you cannot reach it. That's supernatural in power. That you experience the supernatural touch of the Lord on a daily basis. This is what happens when you surrender and you give up control. Don't feel like it's a loss because it's not a loss. Don't feel like you're giving up because you're not giving up. You're actually wanting more, not less. We have to get this straight because the enemy will come and to really bring all of these lies into your mind. You're being irresponsible. You're being too passive. You're not being uh, a good worker or a good husband or a good mother because you're not going out and to try to fix things and you're not trying to make things happen. He's gonna, the enemy is going to have a field day. You're going to you're gonna speak that to yourself too. Oh, I'm lazy. Oh, I'm so, so lazy. I can't be lazy. I need to do more. You will do more. You will do much more when you surrender. Uh, I'm just going to close this time right now and I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and I want to just invite you to come engage the Lord right now because I feel like even as we're talking and I was sharing this message the Lord is already speaking to you about things he wants you to lay down he's already speaking to you I know he is he's speaking things to you about things that you've been carrying on your own where you have your own yoke on and you're doing all the pulling. He may be even speaking to you about things that you feel like are good things, ministry things, important things, your kids or your marriage. But today is the day he wants you to lay those things down and feel good about it. He doesn't want you to beat yourself up. He wants you to feel free and to feel empowered and to feel the rest in the Lord. So right now, 
I want us to corporately do that. I want us to, to cry out to the Lord and to say, Lord, I want you to have these things so I can lay them down so you can lift them up, so you can take them to a higher place that I could never do. I want to surrender. I want to lay my life down to you. I want to lay my family to you. I want to lay my future down to you. I want to lay everything down to you so you can lift it up. So right now, I want us to all join together and just to cry out to our Lord, just to cry out to our Father that we want to accept your invitation to be yoked together with you. And this is step number one, by us saying, I want to lay this down. So on the three, let's all cry out the name of Jesus. One, two, three, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Father, we want to come to you right now.